If you brought a Bible this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Hallelujah. I started a message last week. I'm going to continue along these lines today. Uh, we're dealing with the authority of the believer. Last week we established the fact that all authority belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. He has it all. Amen. amen. Every now and then you can say amen. Amen. Just it, ju it just proves that we're not Baptists, you know. <laughs> and we saw also that Christ conveyed uh, authority to his disciples. So in Luke ten nineteen, he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Behold, I give unto you power. Actually, the word power appears in this verse two times. Twice in the... It's translated power in the King James, but uh, actually it's two different Greek words. When the Lord says, I give unto you power, it's exousia. It's the word for authority. I give you authority over all the power, which is the uh, Greek word dunamis, strength and might. So I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. He gives you authority, he says, to tread on serpents and scorpions. What does it mean to tread on? It means to step on. That's right. I give you authority to step on them. Now, you step on something that you detest, that you despise, that you don't want in your house, perhaps. Uh, but, uh, you know... It, Hopefully that all we're stepping on is little bugs. You know, hopefully it's not serpents and scorpions in our houses. Uh, but he gives us spiritual authority to tread underfoot. That is to crush, to stomp, to have authority over the power of the evil one as represented in the serpent and the scorpion. And uh, he makes it clear when he elaborates and says, and over all the power of the enemy. Amen. Over ALL, all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. I give you this authority. I give you this authority. The one who has all authority delegates authority to us. Amen. It doesn't make us Christ. We're not little gods. But we are deputized by the Almighty to exercise His authority in His name. Right? Now, I want you to back up with me just a little bit. In verse 1, He sent the disciples out two by two. Uh, Luke ten one. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and to before his face into every city and place whether he himself would come. So he sent them out teams of two. That would be 35 teams that he sent out to prepare the way for the Lord's coming because the Lord was going to take a circuitous route and visit all of those villages and towns and so on. And he told them that where they went, they were to, well, verse Nine, they were to heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God is come near unto you. So they were to go, they were to preach the coming kingdom of God, they were to prepare the way for the Lord, and they were to heal the sick. God gave them this commission, this authority, this, these 35 teams, right? And so they went out and did exactly what the Lord commissioned them to do. We don't know how long they were gone. The Bible doesn't say. But when they returned, they came back with this report, verse 17. And the seventy returned again with joy, 
saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. They came back full of joy, exuberant, excited. They went on this missionary trip. Now, that's what the Lord sent them on, a missionary trip. And they came back with a great testimony of what God did while they were gone. I, I love it when we hear the report. Somebody's been on a missionary trip. They come back, tell us what the Lord did, uh, how the Lord moved, what what way the Lord moved. You know, sometimes people prayed for the sick and uh, people were healed, blind eyes open, deaf ears open, lame walk. I, I love it when people come back and they, they share these kinds of reports. Well, they came back exuberant. They gave, they gave this testimony. Even the demons were subject unto us. Now, he didn't exactly tell them to cast out demons when you read the beginning verses here. It, it's implied, but he told them to heal the sick, preach the coming kingdom, and they must have confronted dem demonic activity on their mission. Because, you know, sometimes sickness is demonic. They were commissioned to heal the sick. Many times in the Bible, you will find that sickness had a demonic cause. Uh, you see it in Matthew 9, 32 and 33. You see it in Matthew 12, 22. You see it in Luke 11, 14. You see it in Luke 13, 11 through 16. Uh, you see it in Mark 9, 17 through 29. Uh, you, you just see it in many places. Uh, epilepsy, that uh, what looked like was epilepsy, actually was a demon. Uh, the woman with the spirit of infirmity bowed over. She looked like maybe she had scoliosis or some other crippling uh, hunchback uh, sickness. The Lord said that she's had a spirit of infirmity that had her bound for 18 years. He cast out the demon, she was healed. The, the young boy who was blind and deaf. The Lord cast out a demon, a deaf spirit, and, and the Bible says the boy saw and heard. So they must have confronted demonic activity, and when, it, when that stuff manifested, they rebuked the devil, commanded him to go, and they, they came to this realization. We have authority over demon power. Now, demon power was prevalent in ancient times. Today, we don't think it exists uh, for the most part. People shrug their shoulders at really bizarre behavior, murderous rampages, people who take out a gun and just shoot people at random, or, uh, you know, violent tempers and uh, drunken rages or wife beating or child molesting and... Uh, Sexual predators, we look at all that today, and these, these people are sick. They need counseling. Because we don't recognize demonic activity when we see it. We don't see how it drives people, obsesses people, compels people, causes greater depravity already uh, than, than what they already have. But they discovered even the demons are subject to us in the name of Jesus. They were subject to us in the name of Jesus. Now, when they said this, Jesus actually confirmed in verse 19 that indeed they do have authority over demon power. That's what verse 19 declares. He says, I give unto you authority. To tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The demons that vexed the, the public when the disciples were out ministering, the disciples had authority over those demons. Demons started manifesting in their presence, in their midst, uh, and they, they can manifest in any number of ways. Sometimes, every now and then, I, 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 I will see what I definitely believe is demonic manifestations. Sometimes we see it in church. Sometimes you see it on the mission field. Sometimes you see that there are spirits in people. They are so restless, they, they can't be still. They get in church and it's like they're sitting on, on a hot barbecue pit. They can't be still. They're under such conviction or the demonic influence in them is so powerful that 
It's like they can't sit under the Word of God or can't be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. They, they got to go. They, they're out the door before long. Sometimes it takes other forms. Maybe somebody will sit and glare. You know, like, like they have some murderous intent in their eyes. But you can't jump to the conclusion that that's a demon. Because I have heard stories where a pastor saw that, somebody glaring at him like, they, when church is over, I'm going to kill you, type glare. And when church was over, the fellow said, that was a tremendous message, Pastor. It really, really ministered to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> some people just look that way, I guess. I, I don't know. You know. <laughs> Can't always judge by appearances. huh? <laughs> but, here he says, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. The Lord gave this authority. He spoke this to the 70. Now, the 12 had authority, the 12 disciples. That authority over, over the spiritual realm of demons wasn't limited to just the 12. It extended to the 70. And uh, I want us to see it also extends... To all of us. Today, what I would like to do, if you don't mind walking with me through a few passages in the Bible, I'd like for us to see the relationship, the connection between the Great Commission and spiritual authority. Uh, the Great Commission is recorded in all four Gospels at least in some form. In some of the Gospels, it's a very abbreviated form. But the Great Commission is it, it's found in all four Gospels. And spiritual authority is directly connected to that commission. Now, if you think, well, then that only applies to missionaries and, and, and maybe preachers and ministers who, who, who go out on the mission field. Actually, the Great Commission is to every disciple. It's not just to pastors and, uh, you know, the professional evangelists. The Great Commission is for every single disciple of Christ. And that means spiritual authority is also given to every single disciple of Christ. That is true spiritual authority. We're going to start in Matthew 28. I'd like for you to turn there with me if you don't mind. Y'all with me so far? All right. Every now and then, just make a little noise. Remind me that you're awake and breathing and so on. Matthew 28, we'll start here. This is after his resurrection. Verse 18 is the passage that most... Uh, with the Great Commission, we mostly begin with verse 18, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, spoke to the uh, disciples, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, he has it all. He has all authority. Absolute authority. He's God. Then he says, verse 19, Go ye therefore. And teach all nations. Go ye, therefore, and teach in some places, in a few villages, a, a couple of nations. No, he says, you go teach all nations, and those who receive Christ and repent of sin and, and, and believe, you baptize them, he says. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them... To observe. The idea here is to observe all things, to hold fast to the truth, uh, the Word of God, the teachings of Christ, the example of Christ. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, the end of the world, you could say... Well, that means to the uttermost parts of the earth, no matter where you are. But it also, actually the word is eon, so it means the end of the age or till the end of time. So the Great Commission, where Christ declares his authority, I have all authority, 
Then he sends his disciples out, and he says, I'll be with you to the very end of the age, or the end of time. Means that this spiritual authority that he has, and that they were going to exercise, would not expire after the end of the first century. But he would be with them until the end of the eons, the end of the age, the end of time. He would be with them all the time. Uh, I'm with you always. Now, this is a tremendous, tremendous uh, assurance because here's what it amounts to. I'm commissioning you, he tells his disciples, to carry on my mission. My mission is now in your hands. It's now your commission. Now you take the gospel to every corner of the earth. You go preach. You go teach. You go make disciples. You baptize them. And uh, uh, the rest of the ministry of casting out demons and praying for the sick is all implied in all of this. But he leaves them with this tremendous statement and, and assurance. He says, wherever you go, I will go with you. He says, I am with you always, even to the end of time. I'll be with you always. I'll never leave you or forsake you. So here's the assurance. Wherever you go, wherever you find yourself ministering, wherever you find yourself talking to someone about the Lord, witnessing, praying for them, maybe in a hospital, maybe in a jail, uh, maybe on a street, maybe in a workplace, maybe in your own neighborhood, maybe at some far, far corner of the earth. Wherever you go, you're not alone. Wherever you go, I am with you. I am with you. You're never, ever going to be alone. You're not in this alone. So you can go with this confidence. Lord, it's you and me. It's you and me, Lord. You're never alone. You go preach the gospel. You teach my word. You minister to the hurting, the afflicted, the needy, wherever they are, wherever you find them. You're authorized to use my name to pray for the sick. You're authorized to use my name to cast out demons. Nothing, he says, nothing at all shall by any means hurt you. And, and look, this is what I want us to take out of Matthew 28 before we move to one of the parallel accounts of the Great Commission. I want us to realize that every disciple is commissioned to make disciples. Every disciple is commissioned to make disciples. Every disciple has the commission to take the gospel to the world. Every disciple has the commission to take the gospel to the world. Every disciple has the commission to take the gospel to the world. Now, we, we may not all be able to go personally to the whole world or to the four, far corners of the earth. But we can certainly pray for and support those who do. And we too are to take the gospel everywhere we can into our own sphere of influence. Uh, we live in a country that allows you to preach, teach, and testify. So take advantage of that liberty. Take advantage of the liberty. Uh, because in some countries you can't. But here you can. So let that light shine. Remember what the Lord said. You don't. Hide your light under a bushel. A city on a hill can't be hid. And if you have the light of Christ, uh, you can't really hide that. You know, don't be an undercover, camouflaged Christian. But, uh, but let that light shine. The greatest, the greatest uh, insult of all is uh, you work with somebody for many, many years. And, uh, and, and then one day they say, you mean you're a Christian? I never knew that. I've been working with you for years. I didn't know you were a Christian. Well, how come they don't know? Uh-huh, shame on you. But, but the other thing I want us to take from Matthew 28 before we move is the realization that Christ is personally with each and every one of us wherever we go. Every place we go, Christ is with us. You go in His name, you go as His uh, servant, His disciple, He goes with you. Now, another passage... Another of the parallel accounts is Mark 16. I'd like for you to turn there with me. Stay awake. 
Mark 16, you know, this also is the Great Commission. This is Mark's account, the parallel account. This is considered a parallel to Matthew 28, verses 18, 19, and 20. Here in Mark's account, we get a little bit more information. It's not that these accounts contradict each other. They complete each other. Each of the disciples adds something to the commission. It's uh, eyewitness accounts. You know, every eyewitness adds a little something to, uh, to the, uh, the story, to the situation. Several people witness an automobile accident. One will say, look, car ran the red light, hit that, hit that other car. But the other eyewitness says, yeah, the red car ran the red light and hit the other car. Then the third witness says, yeah, but the, the other car, the black car, was, was speeding. Or, you know, everybody adds a little something to it. Everybody had the same. Everybody was correct. They just added more detail. Mark adds a few details that Matthew didn't add. Mark says, beginning in verse 15, as he gives them the commission, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That's the commission. And he says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. Who gets damned? Those who don't believe. And these signs will follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, and they did what the Lord told them to do. They preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So they obeyed. They took the, the Lord at his word. They carried the gospel to, to their region, to their part of the world. And, uh, you know, they knew the Lord was with them because he told them in, in the Matthew 28, I'll be with you wherever you go. I'll never leave you. Until the end of the ages, he said. So that's second advent. The Lord said he'd be with them. Now, this is very clear. The commission and the authority that is given in the commission was not just for the twelve, not just for the seventy, but for every believer. He says, these signs will follow them that believe. It will follow them that believe. Are you a believer? Yes. Amen. Well, we're supposed to be believers. What if you don't believe? Well, it says, oh, follow believers. That means the authority that was bestowed upon the twelve and then bestowed upon the seventy is now bestowed upon every true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. The authority that the Lord himself gives, authority to use his name, to preach in his name, to cast out demons, to pray for the sick, that authority is now bestowed on every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you can witness to people, you can lead them to Christ, uh, you can give them the gospel message, you can give them the t your, your testimony, you can tell them what they need to do to be saved. You don't have to call for the pastor. That's right. Amen. You don't have to say, Brother Rusty, my, my friend is, is lost. Would you come witness to him? Because you can witness to him. Amen. Would you come pray with him? You can pray with him. It's not that I wouldn't come, but... I mean, I can be in one place at a time. The Lord commissioned the disciples. He could only be in one place at a time. He commissioned 12. He commissioned 70. Now He commissions all of us. Look, we're all deputized. Right. Amen. Good Lord. What if you have somebody at work that's been sick or they, their wife is sick and they're confiding this in you? You say, wait a minute. Let me get on the phone. I'm going to call my pastor. I'm going to see if I can get him over. He's going to pray with you. 
No, you can pray with them. In fact, you have as much authority as I do. I have no more authority than you. No greater degree of authority. Because every single believer is a priest. Every single one of us. We're all authorized, deputized, and energized by the Holy Ghost. Every single one of us. So you can pray with absolute confidence that the Lord is with you. He's with you. He's right there. So when you lay your hand on them in Jesus' name, you are acting as His agent, His deputy in His authority. And you pray for their healing. The Lord is with you. The Lord is in you. And the same thing is true. What if you start talking to somebody and you get some kind of demonic resistance? Or some kind of... Demonic activity, demonic manifestation. It, it could happen. I believe as we plunge more and more into these last days, you'll see more and more of it too. So what do you do then? Well, you panic. You immediately... Uh, no, that's not what you do. You rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You have been given authority. In fact, Jesus said, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That means you can... You can rebuke the devil with the same authority that you exercise over that bug on your rug. Because we can tread on serpents and scorpions. My point is you can have that confidence in your prayers when you rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that demon. I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. You have this authority. He says... I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. And don't be afraid to exercise it because he says nothing will by any means hurt you. Every true Christian has this authority. Every true Christian has this authority in Jesus Christ. It's not just for the pastor or the evangelist. It's for every single one of us. Now, this includes the authority to do what John's account says concerning the Great Commission. Now, John's account of the Great Commission is rather abbreviated, but it has caused some people a lot of confusion. So I'd like for you to turn with me to John chapter 20. We have authority uh, as the Lord's deputized, authorized, energized agents, disciples, to proclaim the Word of God, to see the lost saved. And John 20, 23 says it includes the power to remit or retain sin. Now, what does that mean? John 20, this is John's account of the Great Commission. Verse 20, John 20:20 20, 20 says the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They he showed him his hands and his side. They were they were glad. Jesus said to them again, "Peace be unto me unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you." Now there's the great commission. This is John's account. We saw Matthew's, we saw Mark's. Here's John's account of the great commission. He brings out something Something else, another little detail that is rather fascinating. He says, as my Father sent me, what did Jesus go to do? To preach the kingdom, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. He says, now I send you. As the Father sent me, now I send you. As I was commissioned, you are commissioned, now you go and do what I did. Then... When he said this, he breathed on them, verse 22, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now this is a command for them to be filled with the Holy Ghost, because if you're going to go in power, you're going to have to have the Holy Ghost. Because you sure can't go in your own power. And uh, all of this had its ultimate uh, fulfillment in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the whole church, all the disciples were there. But notice this interesting and somewhat perplexing statement in verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. 
And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Whoever, whosoever sins you remit, now remit has to do with forgiving, you know, being sent away, their sins sent away, uh, are retained, you know, their, their sins re remain. What, what in the world does this mean? It's in the context of the Great Commission. Very important fact here. A very important fact. See it in its context. This passage, the Roman Catholic Church says, means that the Pope has power to forgive men's sins. Power that he then passes on to priests. So priests have the power and authority to forgive men of their sins. So if you sin, you should confess your sins to the priest. And the sacrament of penance, he will give you some absolution and uh, prescribe some prayers for you to pray, acts of contrition, and uh, you can be forgiven. Now, that's the Roman Catholic interpretation. I have to admit it's caused a lot of people some consternation. What does this passage mean? Can, we, we can go around forgiving sins. Well, let's keep in mind it's the Great Commission. That means it's given to all the Lord's disciples. The parallel passages, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 20, they show very conclusively when you take, you know, let the Bible interpret the Bible, that this is the commission to go and preach the gospel. Those who believe will be saved. That's what Mark said. Those who believe will be saved, right? Those who don't believe will be damned. Those who hear and believe, you know, repent of sin, all of that's implicit there. You baptize them, they'll be forgiven, they'll be saved. But the fact is, do you really forgive them? Do you have the power, the capability to actually forgive somebody? I mean, Luke 5, verse 21, who can forgive sins but God only? The Bible says, who can forgive sins but God only? It's blasphemy to think otherwise. But here's what you can do. On the basis of the Word of God, the Gospel, you can declare a person to be forgiven if they believe the Gospel, if they repent of their sins, if they receive Christ, then you can say you're forgiven. On the basis of your faith, if your faith is real in Christ, you are forgiven according to the Word of God you're forgiven. Most Christians, conservative Christians, Bible-believing Christians, see these passages in the declarative sense. We can say with confidence, yes, you, you're saved. Look, if you believe the gospel, if you repent of your sins, believe that Christ died for your sins, rose from the grave, you're saved. Amen. We can declare them to be saved. And we can also say, but if you're trusting in Buddha to save you, if you're trusting in Allah to save you, if you're trusting in your own good works to save you, you're not saved. We can say you're still in your sins and you're going to perish in your sins. You are hell bound, you're on the edge of eternity and in serious trouble. I, I was in a meeting one time, a pastor's meeting, uh, where they invited somebody to speak to all the assembled pastors. I, I had never heard of this fellow before who spoke, but his text was right here in John 20 and verse 23. This was his text. Whoever sins you remit, they're remitted. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. And he had a revelation, he believed. And he told all of us that, that, that God showed him this revelation that we could forgive people of their sins. And so he said, we can drive down the street and see people hanging on a street corner, you know, thugs or gang members or whatever, and you can just point at them and say, in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven of your sins. And he had a whole sermon on this. And, and, and I just kept sinking lower and lower in, in my seat as he elaborated on this uh what he believed was a revelation of the authority that we had in Christ. Now, to the credit of the brother who was in charge of this meeting, he got up and he said, Brother, you got that all wrong. <laughs> he said, we, 
We don't have that authority to go around forgiving people just arbitrarily of their sins. He said, on what basis would we forgive them? On what basis? They didn't repent? They didn't believe on Christ? How can we forgive them? They, but they, there's another way to get saved? There's one way to get saved. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. There isn't any other way. So they can't be saved apart from repentance. They can't be saved apart from faith. Obviously, that's not what this passage means. It has to be taken in context with the parallel passages. The parallel passages, Matthew 28. This is the Great Commission. Go preach the Gospel. Mark 16. Those who believe the Gospel will be saved. If you believe, you will be saved. If you don't believe, well... You're still in your sins. Yeah, the fellow was very adamant about, uh, you know... Yeah, you can just point at him and say, you're forgiven. He was very adamant, but he was wrong. <laughs> That's right. He was adamantly wrong. Well, it's absolute nonsense to think that arbitrarily you can just tell a person... Yeah, you're forgiven. On the other hand, if that person has listened to the gospel proclamation that Christ died for their sins, that he was buried, that he rose from the grave, and that by faith in him and repentance of sin they could be saved, they, you can tell them, you pray, you believe, you are forgiven. Remember the basis 1 John 1 9, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we must believe. You can't remove that element of, of believing. Our authority is not absolute. Only Christ has absolute authority. But our power, our authority as a Christian is extensive. It's not absolute, but it is extensive. I'll tell you how far it extends. It extends over all the power of the enemy. <laughs> over all the power of the enemy. That's pretty extensive. Y'all awake? Yeah. Every believer, every single one of us has authority, as we mentioned, to pray for the sick. You can do it. The Lord will hear your prayer. Are you a believer? Have you received Christ as Savior? Have you repented of sin? Have you received the mighty infilling of the Holy Ghost? Then you know you are authorized, deputized, and energized to pray for the sick. You can pray. God will hear your prayer. He will hear your prayer. He will hear your prayer. Your husband, your wife, your child is sick, weak, or infirm. You have the authority in the name of Jesus as his disciple. To lay hands on them and call upon the Lord. Lord Jesus, I lay my hands upon my wife, my husband, my child, my brother, my sister, this man, this woman, whoever it is. Lord, I lay my hands on them in Jesus' name. And Lord, as I lay my hand on them, Lord, lay your hand on them. Because Lord, you're with me. You're right here. You're with me. Lord Jesus, touch this man. Deliver this person from this infirmity. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke this spirit of infirmity. However the Lord leads you to pray, you have authority. Pray! Pray with that authority! Amen. We must, by exercise of the authority we have in Christ, we must push back the darkness. We must bring the light. And push back the darkness. You pray for them. You witness to them. You be the light right there. I mean, you have the great commission. And whenever necessary, you can cast out demons. You pray for the deliverance of the oppressed. You pray for the deliverance of those that are vexed. Mark 16, these signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. In my name, 
they will cast out devils. In my name, they will cast out. Cast out means eject, expel, put out, drive out, send away. And it, it carries the idea of with great force. So, in my name, the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will cast out, expel, eject, put out, drive out, send away demons. That's the authority you have. Each and every one of us. The authority to cast out demons. The twelve cast out demons. The seventy cast out demons. All of his disciples have this authority. And there's no shortage of demons. There's plenty of them out there. Yeah. You have the opportunity to cast them out. I believe the Lord will give each and every one of us the opportunity to exercise this authority uh, before all of this is over. Uh, sometimes it comes unexpectedly. Some years ago, we had a lady who came to the church. She didn't attend our church, but she came because she knew that we believed in casting out demons. And she came asking for prayer. She said she has a 12-year-old daughter that has really manifested some demonic activity. She said, I need prayer for my daughter and I need prayer for me. And so we prayed for the wife. The husband came while we were praying. He was very upset. He was a minister. Very, very upset that we were praying for his wife. He drug her out, shook his finger at me, uh, you know, basically rebuking me, saying his wife just likes attention, that sort of thing. But I remember he stormed out, put her in the car, and they flew out the parking lot. And I didn't hear from him for a while, but a few months later, this fellow called me. And he said, my daughter, his 12-year-old daughter, is sitting in the kitchen on a stool, growling like an animal, tearing the pages out of a Bible and eating them. And he, he said, she's glaring at me like a wild animal. He said, I, I know, there's no doubt in my mind that this is a demon. Uh, and... And so he, he changed his view about uh, the spiritual realm and uh, the demonic and uh, the fact that maybe his wife wasn't just looking for attention after all, that maybe they had a problem. Uh, but I, I did have a chance uh, to talk with him, to pray with him. I didn't, I didn't even go over there to pray for the daughter. I told him to pray for his daughter. In fact, I went through with him some of the very things I'm talking to you about today, about the authority you have in Jesus Christ. And you know, he prayed for her and she got set free. Amen. I'd like you to turn with me to another passage in Matthew chapter 12. I want us to consider yet another passage. Y'all can hang with me a little while. Amen. Matthew 12, I want us to see an account here of uh, a deliverance. Matthew 12, 22, the Bible says, Then there was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, someone demonized, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. So, he healed him. There was some deliverance involved, obviously, because the person was possessed with the devil. All the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Now you've got the public who witnessed this event. They're saying, "This not this the son of David? Now they're saying, This is the Messiah. That's, that's what they're saying. This, this is the Messiah. When the Pharisees heard it, well, they weren't too thrilled. You know, the Pharisees didn't like the Lord a whole lot as it was. You read down in verse 14, it says, The Pharisees went out, held a council against him, how they might destroy him. So they weren't exactly on good terms with the Lord. They didn't like the fact that uh, he wasn't one of them. Uh, they didn't like the fact that he spoke with such authority. 
They didn't like the fact that the people flocked to him, that uh, he was popular. So when the Pharisees hear this public outcry that he, he is the Messiah, they said, this fellow, now this is really a, a derogatory term when they speak of the Lord in this manner. This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. He doesn't really cast out demons like with God's authority. He's just got a bigger demon in him than they had in this kid. So the bigger demon is pushing out the smaller demons. That's what they accuse him of. He's casting out demons by Beelzebub. The prince, interesting, the prince of demons. It's the Greek word archon. It means to be first, to be preeminent, to be chief, to be ruler. Uh, it's the same root as arch, as an archangel. You know, Michael is the archangel. He is first, he is preeminent, he is ruler, or chief angel. Well, here, Beelzebub, which is just a synonym for the devil, it means lord of the dunghill or lord of the flies. Uh, Beelzebub here is just a synonym for the devil, and it says the devil is the arch demon. He is the chief of the demons. He's preeminent. He's first. And they... They said Jesus is casting out demons by the devil. Verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Now that was true then and it's true now. A house divided cannot stand. A kingdom divided will not last. Uh, We've seen this happen through the years many, many different times. If uh, your house is divided, if it's at war within itself, it won't last unless that conflict is resolved. It, it will dissolve. I mean, we see it in our divorce statistics right here in the United States. Houses divided, two heads, uh, wrangling, fighting, strife, contention. Uh, if no peace comes, you know what's going to happen. A house divided? will not stand. We've seen it happen in businesses where people tear the business apart because of tension, uh, tension and strife and contention. We've seen it happen in churches through the years. Churches divide. Churches uh, erupt because of strife and contention. Our own nation erupted into a civil war uh, back in the middle of the well, late 19th century. And I'll tell you, we, we really really should pray for America all, all the more because we are a nation divided in many, many ways. I mean, ideologically, uh, spiritually, we have some great divisions in, in our nation. Uh, but Jesus applied this fact, this truth, to the devil's own kingdom. And uh, To follow it, you really have to understand that this wasn't a one-time deal where Jesus cast out demons. He'd been carrying on a campaign casting out demons, casting them out every place he went. He continually was casting out demons, right? And uh, the accusation here that, you, you know, you're just casting out a demon by a bigger demon, he says, uh, if Satan casts out Satan, he's divided against himself. How will his kingdom stand? Satan is not divided against Satan. Satan's not going to cast out Satan. I will say this, that there can be times, occasions, and incidents where the Lord... I, I see where the Lord allows things to happen in the spiritual realm, where a, a powerful demon may drive out a less powerful one, in a, like in a case of witchcraft healing psychic healing, or other forms of occult uh, magic and so forth, magic healing. You know, sometimes people have these uh, magic potions, magic spells, and they actually get well of that particular uh, affliction. But they wind up with something else and worse. So they don't really get free, they get 
bound in another way to an even greater degree. So Satan may back up in one area in order to afflict a person with a greater delusion in another area. I believe, now, don't get mad at me, but I believe that this is why a lot of people get healed, or you hear testimonies of people getting healed sometimes at places like Lourdes and Fatima, Medjugorje. Uh, they'll call upon Mary, or they'll call upon... Now, this is forbidden in the Bible. You're not supposed to do that. But sometimes people will do it, and then they'll come away saying, and you know, I prayed for that, and, and I'm better. Uh, they, I, I'm, I'm really better, but what they don't realize is that they're now afflicted and oppressed and vexed in a greater measure in another area. And an even worse, to an even worse degree, and an even worse end. And not only that, but now they are confirmed in their idolatry. They are absolutely confirmed and convinced that their idolatrous practices are real. So, the devil's willing to give a little bit of relief from some physical symptoms in order to damn a soul, if, if he can do it. But, I want us to recognize what Jesus was doing was carrying on a systematic campaign against the powers of darkness. Casting out demons everywhere he went. He says in verse 26, No, Satan isn't casting himself out. He's not casting himself out. Then he turns the tables on his accusers. He says, If I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? They'll be your judges. Uh, there's been a lot of debate as to who your sons are here when it says your children, literally your sons. Uh, who are the sons that they're talking about? Uh, one view is that, well, it could be some kind of Jewish occultist, uh, magical practitioners like the seven sons of Sceva. They use potions, they use spells, they use charms and amulets and, you know, candles and holy water and all that to try and cast out a demon or appease it or whatever. Uh, but more likely, Linsky's view is probably more accurate. He says it's a reference to the sons of the prophets. The sons of the prophets, they were the ones who preached in the name of the Lord. They preached with power and authority. Demons fled before them. And they took great pride. The Pharisees took great pride in their, uh, you know, their heroes of faith, the sons of the prophets. And he says, well, look, the ones you're so proud of, they're going to actually be your judges on that great and terrible day when you stand before the Almighty to give account for the blasphemies that are coming out of your mouth. The ones who cast out the demons will be your judges. He says, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Now, this is a very interesting picture, and I'm going to ask you to try and follow me here for a moment. How else can you enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, take his possessions, unless you first bind the strong man, and then you can spoil his house, you can take his stuff. Now, here's the picture. Satan here is compared to a strong man. When you say a strong man, you're talking about a mighty man. Luke's gospel, the parallel account, brings out the fact that he's an armed man. That is one well-armed. You wouldn't want to break into somebody's house that you knew was strong, powerful, and had an arsenal at his immediate disposal. You're not going to try and break into that guy's house while he's there and awake because you're going to wind up dead. You're not going to spoil his house it's interesting that the Lord uses this analogy or this as an example of, of uh, spiritual authority here because he actually pictures the devil like a, uh, a, like a, a robber of some kind, a powerful outlaw, like the devil is like a, a pirate uh, captain and he is chief over all the other pirates and they have all this booty that they've stolen and they watch over it. They guard their gold and their treasures and so forth. That's the picture. He's the strong man guarding all the stuff he's conquered and captured. In this case, those that he's conquered or captured are actually the souls of men. 
who are vexed and oppressed and bound and held captive by the devil at his will, according to the scriptures. And here you have the devil as this, you know, pirate captain, if you allow me to use that as an analogy, who presides over it and watches over it. You wouldn't just break into a guy's house like that because he'd overpower you. He'd shoot you, stab you, strangle you, murder you in a dozen different ways unless he was tied up. What if he was all tied up? What if he was powerless to stop you? Well, that's exactly what he says here. Unless the, the strong man is first bound. What if he's all tied up? Then you can go into his house and take all that gold back. Or in this case, using the devil as the example of the one who binds men's souls and vexes them and keeps them captive, you can go and, and recapture those captives. Look, this is a very, very uh, interesting analogy that the Lord uses because if the devil's tied up, he's powerless to stop you. Amen? Amen. Uh, somebody stronger than him comes along and plunders his house and delivers the oppressed. I'm going to turn to one last passage this morning. You think you can hang with me for another couple minutes? All right, Luke 11. Luke 11, I want us to see this one. Satan, according to the Bible and according to these passages, is a prince. Prince of the power of the air, prince of this world, prince of demons, the Bible says. And uh, he heads up a great hierarchy of evil, evil principalities and powers, the Bible says, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Uh, evil spirits that keep men and women bound and blind and so on. In Luke 11, and beginning in verse 20, Jesus says, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace... His goods are in peace. Well, there he is. You know, he's the, he's the robber baron. He's got all of his stuff. He's guarding. He's got his arsenal. He's got his weapons. He's guarding his uh, gold, his treasures. He's keeping his stuff safe. But, verse 22, when a stronger than he shall come upon him, somebody mightier, somebody more powerful, and overcome him, he takes from him all his armor wherein he trusted. He just beats the guy down, captures him, and takes his spoils. Takes it all away. Now, who's stronger than the devil? Who has been given all authority in heaven and earth? So, the devil, even though he is a prince, prince of this world, prince of the power of the air, prince of darkness... Even though he has uh, great power, there is one stronger than he. There's one stronger than he, isn't that right? Amen. And that is the Lord who has been given all power, all authority. Of course, he's the creator of all things. So he is stronger than the devil. The, it's interesting the Lord uses this analogy to illustrate what he was doing when he was casting out devils. That's what he does. He's illustrating what he was doing when he cast out devils. You know what he was doing? He was plundering the plunderer. That's what he was doing. He was taking back the lives, souls, uh, bodies, spirits of men and women uh, who had been in Satan's captivity. Jesus could do it because he had all authority, absolute authority. And the devil was powerless to stop him. Powerless. Po Could the devil stop the Lord? No, because a greater than he was there, a stronger than he was there, to bind him. Uh, so Satan was powerless. Even the prince of darkness could do nothing 
to stop Jesus from delivering the vexed, casting out demons, delivering the oppressed, delivering the enslaved, delivering the sick, tearing back the darkness with the light. Now, I want you to think about this. The strong man was powerless before the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus plundered his house. The strong man could not harm Jesus. Couldn't shoot him, couldn't stab him, couldn't stop him. And then this is what the Lord says. He can't hurt you either. Because I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The strong man, you're coming to plunder his house. You're going to plunder the plunderer. You're going to cast out demons. You're going to lay hands on the sick. And he can't stop you. He can't stop you. And he can't hurt you. Because in the name of Jesus, you have the very authority that Jesus gives you over all of Satan's power. So, absolutely use it. Be encouraged. And be victorious in the authority that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this morning that you would give us a greater understanding of the authority that you give to your disciples. Authority over evil. Authority over the devil. And authority over the evil that would seek to prevail even in our own lives and thoughts. We can rebuke those thoughts in the name of Jesus. Evil thoughts, ungodly thoughts, blasphemous thoughts, lustful thoughts, covetous thoughts. All the things that would try to distract, hinder, vex, and oppress us. You give us authority even there. Authority, Lord, to rebuke, to renounce, and to protect this temple, our bodies. Lord, we ask also that along with this realization of the authority that, that is ours in Christ, would come a great boldness and confidence to use it. To use it to see our loved ones delivered and set free. To use it as disciples who are carrying out your commission in our own sphere of influence. Use us, Lord. Let us be bold, Lord. Let us pray with confidence, Lord. Let us trust you to do what you said. You said these signs would follow them that believe. Lord, deliver us from any unbelief in these matters. And use us for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen, amen. amen.